to the work session of the Salt Lake City Council for January 15th, 2019. Um, we have a few really important items on our agenda tonight, uh, including the discussion and uh, finalizing the process for the selection of the new council member from District 4. Uh, that will be the last thing on our agenda. Um, before I get started, though, I, we usually don't um, do this at work sessions, but um, I do want to go over the rules of decorum. Um, we, in our work session today, we do not have uh, an open public comment period. Uh, this is strictly a work session of the City Council. Uh, it is a public meeting. You are all welcome to uh, be here and attend, uh, but we ask that uh, you remain uh, courteous, that you don't applaud, uh, boo, jeer, cheer. Uh, regarding any of the comments that uh, council members or staff uh, will, be, will be making. Uh, if you do um, disrupt the meeting, because this is, uh, as a public meeting, uh, we do have important business that we are trying to conduct. Uh, if, if there is an issue and um, the meeting is disrupted, we will uh, be asking uh, the person who's disrupting or people who are disrupting to leave the meeting. So. I just wanted to make that uh, statement up front. The first item on our work session agenda is uh, the Capitals Facilities Plan. Um, and Ben, there's Ben. Hi, Ben. Uh, ben Led Ledke from the Council Office, Mary Beth Thompson, uh, the Chief Financial Officer uh, for the City, and Melissa Jensen, Director of Hand. Um, ben, I will turn the time over to you. The administration has a presentation which is also in your packets. Uh, I think it would be helpful to start with the presentation and then I have some additional thoughts for the council's discussion and then we can open it up for questions. You guys can switch. For the presentation. I'm going to do the presentation. I'm going to do oh. the mouse for her. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I asked if I could do this for her. It's the one, it's the one thing I'm good at. <laughs> Thank you. We'll get started here. Mary Beth and I uh, will take this off. I'll lead on the presentation, but know that um, really anything related to the capital facilities plan or impact fees is a joint effort, not only between housing and neighborhood development and finance, but also all of the departments. So uh, what is a capital facilities plan? The way that we've laid it out and what was transmitted to the council is, is really a 10-year plan for capital improvements throughout the city. Um, I think you kind of know this. I think one thing we want to keep in mind in terms of the capital facilities plan is that it's a guiding document for um, impact fees and for the CIP program as a whole. And there's certainly a relationship there and an exchange, but it's not a formal plan that is adopted and then guides those. It's a living and evolving document. I also want to point out that um, in this first go around, what you received was our sort of first attempt at a capital facilities plan. And what that means is that uh, it's not going to solve all of our issues or challenges, but we are going to continue to sort of push the envelope and become increasingly more strategic year over year. And I think we're all committed to that and see the value in uh, that partnership. And I also want to point out that the capital facilities plan is not a budget, uh, but it is a framework to help make budgetary decisions. So as we um, have begun this journey, we've also looked around at other cities. So in the PowerPoint, um, if you have the electronic version, this will actually take you to links in those plans that we've looked at around the country. There is uh, many names that a capital facilities plan comes by uh, throughout cities. So sometimes it's focused on a five-year impact fee plan. Other times it's viewed holistically as a capital facilities plan. In this plan that we've presented to you, we sort of view it holistically um, in that some of the things in the plan are not going to be impact fee eligible. It doesn't mean that it's not an expense or an item that the city needs to purchase. And so it helps us view the whole picture of the city's needs as opposed to just a portion. Moving on, I just want to spend a moment on definitions because it will also help us understand how we got here. Um, the capital... Um, the definitions are ones that we work within finance to ensure that they meet the um, 
regulations outlined in the general accounting rules that are there. Uh, what you see in CIP, what you see in the log every year is really a capital improvement project and that's a cost usually ranging between 50,000 and 5 million. Now as many of you know, our pay as you go has only been about two or three million each year so we've rarely actually been able to fund any projects that are one million or two million or above because there's sort of this too many asks, not enough money, and that's presented challenges. A capital asset project uh, usually has a useful life of more than five years and costs more than five million. In these projects, we tend to see bonding as a tool to help us achieve those assets. And then, of course, there's capital asset renewal. And this is replacing systems, right, that um, over 5,000 that need to be replaced. What we've seen on the side from deferred maintenance is as we've deferred so much of our maintenance, ultimately it turns into a capital asset renewal. And I think um, in terms of the capital facilities plan, it's important to recognize that one piece of the plan is impact fee related, but many are not. And so some are growth related, but some are new projects entirely. The CFP framework, so how did we get here today? I, I wanna start by saying that we engaged with a consultant, um, many of you know, and he's been up here many times, Fred Philpott, and I imagine as you anticipate having questions and wanna discuss this more, he will join us here to, uh, as, as this document evolves. We worked with him to really develop a scope to help us get together this capital facilities plan. The major portion of his scope was, la was related to helping facilitate um, the sort of facilitation of all the projects, the organization, the costs associated with it, and then producing a pro forma and um, a financial model to evaluate future revenue with. So this is a pretty key piece because ultimately what he um, has been charged to do is not only help us understand what a capital facilities plan could be, but help us understand the relationship between revenue and expenses and the many tools that we use in there. Um, one thing to point out is that eventually we're going to have to pull, you know, as we think about moving forward and the financial model, pulling, you know, the bond piece in and maybe the sales tax to really understand the comprehensive tools we have at our disposal. We, um, below you kind of see the many uh, projects and the definitions that were used to sort of inform what types of projects went into that plan. Again, noting that some are new and really, and then others are renewal, those capital renewal pieces, and they're divided in that way. I think the other thing I will add is that once you have sort of this financial model, you have your list of projects, you have your full picture, that's when you really start to say, what is our revenue projection? How does that influx? You delineate the tools that you have at your disposal, and then you really discuss strategies for meeting those. Which leads us to our enormous funding gap, which will be no surprise to anybody uh, in this body. Um, and I think that we all know that revenue does not meet the need and sort of that white space that you see on the graph is really related to general fund. Um, many of the things that are impact fee eligible are sort of allocated there, but ultimately the question is how do we begin to prioritize and understand our needs holistically and then what kind of strategies do we want to employ to begin to tackle these needs long term? I think in short, what you want to be able to do is manage your general fund contribution and then understand that while it's never enough, you want to manage the relationship between the revenue and expenses, which is also why it's important to pick this up every year and not you know, let it sit on the shelf for some time. Here we kind of just talk about uh, the characteristics of the capital improvement program as a whole. We are, I think it would be now would be a good time just to talk about some of the changes that we're making in terms of, um, while they don't relate, relate directly to the capital facilities plan before you, if we view the capital improvement program as a whole, we are really trying to um, use the capital facilities plan as a framework and evolving to inform how we also do the CIP. So one thing that uh, Mary Beth and I have committed to um, is the CIP book this year, and Mary Beth has been a very strong advocate of that and wanting to do that, and so we sat down recently and said, we're gonna do it. And I think what that will allow is, um, actually I'll let Mary Beth talk about it because it's really separating out the budget book from the CIP book. Yeah, so I've talked about it on several occasions, and I think that um, it will show you a long, longer description than you normally get on the spreadsheet. It's going to show you a um, 
location and it's also going to give you a picture so you can kind of see what it looks like and feels like. I've, I've researched several CIP books and you know they range from five years to a year as Melissa said some of those we we interpret that as a capital facilities. I see the capital facilities we're calling it a plan. I see it as in the fall it'll become a book and that capital facilities book will feed into the CIP book so it'll be from one directly into the other and so you'll be able to see those relationships going forward that the capital facilities plan will feed into the CIP plan and I believe that we're going to work on that this year going forward as well. The capital facilities plan is going to facilitate the CIP projects going forward. So that will help facilitate that but the book will be self-explanatory, have objectives, goals, and then we can solidify that as a body in, and everyone can understand it. It's very transparent to the council, to the residents of Salt Lake City, and to us going forward. So we're really excited about that um, <clears throat> and looking forward to it. I think, you know, the, the partner to that sort of good image of the projects and what they cost and the maintenance and making that Excel sheet a little more um, understandable, not just for you, but for the public, is sort of saying, once we understand all of the needs and the projects and ensuring that what goes in the capital facilities plan is pulled out so that you can use CIP as a tool is sort of this financial model and really understanding that we can't predict the future. We don't know if we're going to enter a recession, if general revenue next year or the next three years is going to go way down. And so you have to view it as a mobile tool and you sort of have to put it in there to understand the possibility, but knowing that markets are unpredictable. So I think this gets a little bit to the process of what Mary Beth was speaking to. So you have a capital facilities plan that's been transmitted. In there is a thorough listing Excel sheet, not ideal, uh, but certainly is a place to start. And we are about to um, engage with the CDCIP board on their projects. I think it, what we hope is that there's some sort of exchange there, right? There's some, there should be some correlation. I think it's fair to say that not every single uh, project that you'll see on the uh, board recommendations will match the capital facilities plan, but it's a good learning for us to take a step back and say, well, why isn't it in the capital facilities plan? Did it get missed? Did it come up later? Because as we continue to refine this, we want the capital facilities plan to be a reliable document to drive CIP and other tools. And so we are working both internally with departments and divisions to continue to make sure that the, the data that we gather is helpful to you so that as policymakers you can use that as a guide when making board decisions at the end. So I want to go into just the division overview. Um, I think to, we tried to take an attempt at sort of consolidating all of the numbers from the listing that you have and we can continue to work on this and as there are items that you want to see or want more clarity on, we're certainly open to figuring out a, um, a way to exchange information. You'll notice um, normally on these they'll be in two categories. For engineering, of course, it's just renewal projects and so you can kind of see a summary. Um, what we know is that the bond will help cover some of the unfunded gap between the Class C that's available. So we imagine, you know, CIP, uh, the impact fees, general fund, and the bond all working together and so they plan to leverage that. That's not fleshed out in your current capital facilities plan and something that needs to be considered in a comprehensive financial model as we move forward. And then, of course, those scenarios, if you can kind of combine them, would definitely shed light um, on the next five to six years as that bond money is deployed. Next, you have facilities. And so you can see in facilities, you have a new, and then you also have some renewal categories. I think facilities is an important um, sort of division to call out because it's unique. What we've done here, on the new, you obviously see a high fluctuation because new assets often cause, uh, often cost a lot of money to capitalize up front. And then from basically 2021 to 2028, you see about 6.8 million a year. And this, what this really reflects is um, facilities asset management Plan, which I know that many of you have had the opportunity to uh, review and so it also speaks to the capital facilities plan working jointly with divisions to create a full picture. The 6.8 number obviously comes from <clears throat> their need to continue to uh, renew uh, assets that are deteriorating and because there's been so much deferred maintenance over the years 
basically it's hard to determine what will break next. And so if you have an ongoing funding annually that's allocated, um, it is possible that it needs to be reallocated based on emergencies. And we're still thinking about how to deal with that from a logistical standpoint inside the capital facilities plan. Next up you have parks. Melissa, and so, yep. <clears throat> quick question, if you yes, can go back to facilities. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that, that we have talked about as a council is the east side precinct. Where would that be in this plan? Would that be under facilities? Would it be somewhere else? You know, I will look up in the capital facilities plan how it's categorized. My tendency is that it would be a new facility, but I would, um, I know it's in the plan. Yeah. I just want to double check on the category. Okay. Thank you. So it's listed under facilities in 2020, and this is one of the projects that since this was transmitted back in October, we've learned a lot more about what an Eastside Police Precinct would really cost, and so it, it's listed at $15 million, and based on the specific you know, location and what, what the details are, it could be $20 million was one of the scenarios for bonding that was looked at by the council. So that's one of the, okay. the large projects to consider updating when it comes back to the council. Sure, as long as, as, long as it's in there and, and you know, we can update it or do whatever, so thank okay. you. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank Thanks. you. So then moving on to parks. Um, obviously in parks you're gonna see a lot more uh, utilization of impact fees. I mean, there's no guarantee that all those impact fees will be available, of course, but you also see it's a, a high level of projects. This, of course, was also a result of sort of their um, strategic plan that they're working on. And then you have um, largely their renewal, which is uh, also still has a huge funding gap in it. <clears throat> And then over to uh, transportation. So you kind of have a summary there as well that um, differentiates between new and renewal. And one of the things that we have to keep in mind with uh, Salt Lake City in particular is that there's not a, a bell curve. You know, it's not like we reach and then our level of service goes down. It's continuing to go up over time. So this is gonna be an ongoing problem that we're gonna face as the city grows. I will go into um, next steps and what we would like to do. Now that we have, we have reached a point with the list and the capital facilities plan that we need to um, update it. We want to take a, a new look at the um, listing, understand the bond. We're going to have to activate the financial model and determine what kind of projections we're comfortable with. Uh, we plan to use the existing CFP to help facilitate CIP decision making. So the board, the CDCIP board, will also have access to this document and understanding it. And then we're hoping to work from now until the fall internally with uh, finance, the departments, and uh, the administration as a whole to do some policy recommendations around the financial modeling and what that might look like. To give you a sense, I mean, policy recommendations is so vague, but you know, what amount do you want to use for pay-as-you-go versus bonding? Um, how does the current bond implement it? Is there a new revenue source that we want to consider in the financial model? And so we'll kind of be analyzing and evaluating all of these pieces as we go forward. And then I just put on here as a side note, even though it's not directly related, that we're currently working on the update to the impact fee facilities plan as well. Anything else to add, Mary Beth? So I know that didn't take an hour, <laughs> uh, but I also assume that you might have questions or thoughts and, and happy to capture those if we can't answer them directly. So once you update the CFP, you'll come back in the fall of this year and give this a new plan so we can look at it. Um, do you think by then you'll have the uh, impact fees plan uh, done as well in the fall? I would think so. The impact fees, uh, uh, well, I should clarify, the impact fees facility amendment that we're working on currently is directly related to transportation. Of course, there's a side amendment that's also happening related to the northwest quadrant and larger issues. So we're trying to manage the parallel process, right? So we want to make sure that we get transportations updated quickly, so that will for sure be done. And then the other piece will be ongoing, and it's hard for me to say when that piece will be done. Okay. Council members, any questions? It was a really fast hour, Melissa. <laughs> really appreciate it. Oh, Andrew does. Sorry, Andrew. Mr. Johnston. Trigger happy over there. Um, for for the different departments, I know some departments plan ahead for major uh, infrastructure upgrades they need to do, uh, buildings, um, growth, whatever it is. Can you give me a sense of 
do all the departments do this? Is it our normal process of their um, kind of planning? Or how does this work between departments? Are there, is there a uniform sort of expectation that all of them are looking five years in advance? or? Give me a sense of that. I would say that each department has a mechanism for determining what their needs are. Some are more refined than others. Um, but I would say certainly even with the um, studies that were done in preparation for the bond, all of that data is readily available. And it's also being updated. So the challenge with the capital facilities plan, for example, is parks uh, basically took their expert knowledge, but they were still in the process of doing their full uh, parks needs assessment at the time. So it's I would say it's a really good indication. But of course, once that is fully done, then and we're going to want to update the CFP to reflect that plan. So the timing doesn't always merge exactly. And so the best we can do is kind of update it as that knowledge becomes available. Okay. The other thing that I would add is that the capital facilities plan, we didn't say, and your scope is immediate life threatening needs or something. You know, we said, what is everything that you think is needed? And so it's also a question about, do we begin to scope the CFP in a more manageable way? And that's, I think, a, a policy discussion to be had. Jennifer, uh, do, do you want to follow up just, on that? Yeah, just to add a little bit onto um, what was um, discussed. It also, I think, naturally, once you get into your budget discussions, that's sort of a natural sorting mechanism because obviously the needs identified in the CFP are far and above the available dollars that you have in any given budget year. So you sort of tweak your priorities each year. You might have a more urgent need in one department than another, and that's part of the mayor's recommendation to the council, so that's factored into that. Um, but it's instructive to know what your total gap is that you're looking for so you know um, if you need to sort of take more dramatic action to adjust your revenue sources like a streets bond for example mm -hmm. um, that was partly informed with all the years of data that we had about <laughs> the the funding need and the funding gap and there was just no way to chip away at it with the year-to-year -year general fund allocation so I guess my question would be in a, in a well, an example would be the east side precinct we just talked about I'm going to ask a question that's not probably answerable, but I'm going to do it anyway. So going back six months or a year, would that precinct have shown up on a facility's need, so to speak, or because we can make priorities based on our decisions, but it doesn't necessarily match up with what this would sort of say, right? So I'm trying to figure out for me, if I were to get a full plan in front of me and by department to department, they'd have listed, you know, renewal stuff, here's new stuff we think we're going to need based on all sorts of reasons. Um, yeah, I guess the refining it a little bit to help, will help me understand um, why this would be important. So this, the, uh, the wastewater treatment plan is important because there's a federal timeline and a deadline, right? So we know that. The police precinct didn't necessarily have that. Um, so how we sort of refine through there and understand for me the difference between the priority list for a department based on all these other factors and how do they get weighted and those kind of questions. So, I think that's something certainly we can take back from this discussion and know that you want to see and we can work towards that. I think that's really achievable and would help sort of refine the list. Yeah, it helps me understand sort of the, the, re, the rationale for each of these. Um, because there's always information about why it's needed. Um, I may not always see that, though. <laughs> there's a federal requirement. There's expiring, we know expiring impact fees. There's something else happening here behind the scenes that I may not be aware of. And I can't bind future councils in any way. But as we're thinking through our revenue um, and bonds coming off and those kind of questions, uh, it'd be important to sort of forecast well, a little bit. And Councilmember Johnston, one of the things that, uh, regarding that east side precinct, while um, it was added to this. It was in the um, impact fee plan, mm -hmm. and it has been in the impact fee plan for a while. So it was a policy decision, I believe, when, the, when, when it was added to this, um, which is kind of how this document, it, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is this document operates more on the policy side. Um, the impact fee uh, plan, you know, usually this will include items from that impact fee plan, not everything, but you know, things will will be added. So I think that's my understanding as to how it was how it was done. Yeah. Jennifer, if I could add, just there's different categories of projects I think, and some that are informed more by the standard growth of departments, and others that I think the standard growth of departments then has a layer of the policymakers making a decision. And then what's good is when the policymakers' decision gets then built into the plan. So it's kind of a 
a cycle, I guess you could say. So one, one affects the other, but as long as they're all talking, that's the important thing. So that we're not losing track of any, any of the ideas. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. It's, it's circular, so there's not one beginning and one end, but it's important that they're all constantly exchanging. Yeah, the only other thing I would ask then is, um, I like, I like the, the gear analogy, it makes some sense. Um, the, the thing I was thinking about was when we brought up a full inventory of all vacant land and then all city assets, right? And it, this was a part of that analysis about here's all the city assets, here's what the needs are for uh, maintenance or upgrades, whatever it is. Um, I can see us having a, a discussion about highest and best use of certain assets. Um, and does this program department piece of the city need to be in this physical location? Um, that's a broader discussion, so I would bring that into this as well, that this could inform that to some extent, but I think that would really inform this. <laughs> if we have certain land, I'm thinking certain land downtown where the price has escalated to a certain amount that it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to be there on that piece anymore for whatever reason, um, and that'd be a bigger discussion. Um, but that would play into a planning document where would this piece of city government need to go. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Johnston. Uh, other questions or comments from the council? Mr. Chair, uh, I have yeah. some staff thoughts that might help inform the discussion. We would love to hear your staff thoughts. One of the metrics the council might be interested in is looking at the alignment of projects in the capital facilities plan and the projects you actually fund in CIP each year. Since the CFP is supposed to be informing your annual appropriations, you could check each year for that alignment and you would hope for a high percentage of agreement between the two. And if you don't see that, maybe you're missing something in your capital facilities plan that you really want to be in there. So that's one of the metrics you could look at each year to see if this is getting at your intention. There's also a lot of space for the council to give policy direction about what you want this plan to accomplish. Most of the council members met with the administration to get a preview and talk about it. And I noted several uh, policy goals that were talked about in those meetings. Uh, and I'll just read a, a list that I made note of. So some of these goals are uh, mutually exclusive or it might be aspirational, you don't hope to get all the way, but you wanna make significant progress. So some of the ones I heard were to bring all facilities out of deferred maintenance as a 10-year goal. And that might require having less of an emphasis on some of the other divisions and focusing on facilities for this cycle of the CFP, but that would be a goal you could measure and track your progress toward. Okay. Another goal would be expanding the city's urban trail network with an emphasis on east-west connections. You could also increase the overall condition index of the city's street network, which is currently poor, according to the survey of all city streets, and increase it to fair. And engineering, rec engin engineering estimates that would be $220 million on top of what we already spend. And the $87 million streets reconstruction bond gets you 40% of the way there. And so if the council decided to emphasize that goal through the capital facilities plan, you could help plug that funding gap even further over the next 10 years. And we have the data to measure that. And that, that's one of the things that you'll notice is a theme through each of these is measuring, measuring your progress as a performance. Another one is implementing the Foothill Trails Master Plan, which is before the council hasn't been adopted, but has discrete projects that you could also track over the 10-year CFP. Another one I heard was advancing the city's sustainability goals through building efficiency and energy upgrades. And you could also take a step back and look at whether it's worth focusing on current assets and renewing those and delaying new assets since we don't have funding strategies for maintenance for some of these projects. So you could say, yes, we want these new shiny things, but we're not gonna do those in the next few years. We wanna focus on renewing our current assets. So there's a, a large policy space for the council to set goals for the capital facilities plan to try and achieve. Okay, and that kind of fits with what we were talking about earlier in our uh, RDA meeting um, to really start tackling some of these uh, maintenance 
issues that have been neglected for a long time. Mr. Chair, if I could just yeah. um, chime in, maybe a, a next step could be um, that most of those policy goals come with a hefty price tag. And so um, it would be important for us to kind of include at least ballparks of those kinds of things so that as you're balancing, because like Ben said, some of them are mutually exclusive, sure. um, you can balance with those that kind of information in mind. Maybe that's a discussion that you tee up for just prior to the budget. Um, yeah, I think that would be like very that. helpful. Yep. Great. We'll follow up with the administration and get some of those high level estimates. Okay. Any more staff ideas? Uh, when you look at the capital facilities plan, it would be helpful to know if there are things missing, not just projects, but uh, would you like to see a map, a location of all of these projects? Uh, would you like to just see existing versus new? Uh, do you want to see the projects displayed in a different way? I think, I think just my sense, I think you know, having a map, um, a, a different map for both, or something that could be electronically overlaid uh, onto a map so we could see, you know, if we were to fund the full amount or if we were to, you know, fund something partially or, um, you know, where that could work with not well with both our existing uh, responsibilities and then also the potentially new ones. There. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Fowler. Sorry, sorry Councilmember oh. Wharton. You can go. Um, I agreed with what Charlie said. That's all. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm a very visual person, so it would be helpful to have something like that so that we can see where all these things are because a list that I don't, I, is a lot. I mean, because there's so many projects, so it would be helpful to kind of be able to visualize it a little bit. Would it be easier to visualize it by dollars as well? Because yes. you're right, the list is huge, right? Okay. So if you took the list and say, we want to do new versus existing up to a million dollars, from a million to five million dollars, from five million to ten million, you could have those. Yeah, I think I think that I mean if you if you followed the RDA meeting and saw how all how excited we all were about a spreadsheet, um, if you could come up with a map that would add that stuff, we'd be downright giddy. So, um, but yeah, I think that'd be great. Councilmember Wharton, any other thoughts? Okay, Councilmember Fowler, nothing. Okay. All right, thank you all very much, and we will, yeah, wait to hear back. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is item number two, the CenturyLink franchise agreements. Uh, Kira Luke uh, from the council office and Dan Rip uh, from HAND will talk about this. Hi, Kira. Hello. Mr. Chair. All right. Well, while Dan is on his way up, I will, if you want to launch into it and introduce us to this topic. I'll kick us off. Um, I know the council's seen a lot about small cells lately. This is a switch back to the more traditional type of telecommunications franchise agreement. So this is three separate ordinances that will be brought to the council for consideration, each with an entity of CenturyLink. Um, these are each for 10 years, and they're a fairly standard franchise agreement. It's similar to other telecommunications franchises the council has seen before. Um, the staff report has some of the, again, standard policy questions you've seen before, but there's a couple of new ones. Um, number one asks about the budget impact, and all of these staff reports are, or the policy questions are designed to kind of capture that technology is evolving and to kind of check in and see if there's a way that our franchise agreements are or could be evolving along with it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dan. Great, thank you. I think that Kara summarized everything about the franchise agreement well and uh, very standard stuff that we've seen um, very typically in the past with these franchise agreements. Great, uh, questions from the council? Uh, I was just going to ask if anyone from CityLink is here and if they could start working on the council office first. Um, <laughs> yes. yes, we're having some network issues and it's not inspiring a ton of confidence right now. Um, no, I do want to ask about um, tree trimming in the urban forester. Um, it says that they um, 
that they may trim the trees um, with the direction and approval of the urban forester. But how how is that going to uh, work in practice, and how are we going to track whether or not they've um, complied with urban forestry? Uh, that's a really good question. I'm not sure what the urban forester, as far as process, has for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I can speak to what's in the contract that does require them to coordinate that. So whatever permit process that they would need to follow in order to do trimming of trees um, certainly would be uh, have to be followed. But definitely a question I'm happy to follow up with the urban forester to get back to you on the, the logistics of that. If you'd like, yes, please. And uh, okay. just my standing renewed or renew my standing question about digital inclusion. Yes, and in fact, since our conversation last week, I've reached out to each of the providers and asking them for feedback on their digital inclusion policies that I, I'll share with council as that comes in. Thank you. You bet. Other comments, questions? All right, Kira, Dan, thank you. You bet. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, we are going to change the agenda just a little bit, and instead of number three, we're going to hit number four, which is the council policy manual updates. Uh, Brian Fulmer from our council office, as well as Cindy Lou Trishman, are here. Good evening. Hi, Brian. Hi there. Uh, as you're aware, the policy manual is used by the council and staff to identify processes and make sure we have clear expectations of the processes we go through. And there are also times that the administration and the public use this as a resource to, or as a reference. From time to time, we need to make changes to the manual to reflect current practices. And over the past several months, staff identified a number of policy manual sections that would benefit from an update. The highlighted sections in your staff report uh, are those that are mostly housekeeping in nature and uh, generally just minor text changes for clarity to update to what we're currently doing. Staff proposes that policy changes be adopted by resolution so that there is a, a clear public record and we're maximizing transparency. We include a draft resolution language in the staff report and uh, would like to ask the council if you're supportive of making these changes by resolution. Great. Any comments? Thoughts, concerns? I'm just glad that they're on top of it, making these changes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So I think, yeah, I, um, I don't think we need to straw poll it. I think we're you know comfortable moving that. forward. Okay, to great. That. Then moving on to uh, two of the sections, uh, A48 and A49 are computers and internet services and communications equipment, and the agenda process, as many of you may know, has progressed over the years from a completely paper-based, delivered to council members' homes, to now where you're uh, accessing the agenda and packet materials through computers and tablets and, and your phones. The equipment needs have changed along with the progression of, with the agenda process, and council members now have different devices and, and uh, also allowances to help you fulfill your council responsibilities. These sections were last updated in 2009, and as you know that there have been significant changes to technology since then, and so staff feels like it's best to remove the existing language because of so many changes and just uh, replace it with what the council is currently doing. We provided the draft language and also some policy questions uh, for the council to consider. And it would be helpful to staff to go through the policy questions so we can make sure that we're consistent uh, when these issues arise. So that so that we have three questions right here, right? That yes, you're, uh -huh. that you're interested in. Um, the first is which device or devices can the city provide uh, to enable council members to effectively do their job? Currently, you have access to a computer, either a laptop or a desktop, a tablet, and a phone. 
And, uh, yeah, is that, do you all feel that that's sufficient? Do any of you want a pager? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I, I mean, I, for me, that, that is, you know, more than sufficient. I think it, I think it, you know, allows everything else. But if there's something else, um, more than open to it, but sounds like we're good. Okay. Uh, so the second one would be, oh yeah, yeah, Cindy. What do you think of adding then a little, a, a bit to say that based on the need of the council members, um, uh, additional items could be uh, approved. Once in a while we'll have somebody who likes to work on spreadsheets and wants a second screen or something like that. Um, Oh. <laughs> I think one screen period. I like no, I, it's fine. If, if you have specific issues, um, I mean, we're, we're doing it right now, so I think just having that as the policy makes sense. Oh. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, the second question, should services be provided for all devices, for example, data plan on phone and tablet, or depending on the circumstance? What do we do right now? A variety. Yes. Uh, what? A variety. A variety. Okay. It's most of it is based on what you access the most too. Like if you use your tablet the most, then we make sure that you have access to everything. If you're most often on laptop, so forth. So we're providing everything we hope that you need, but we're here to find out if there's more services that we're missing. Okay. Do any of you feel like you have um, you're unable to do your jobs because of you don't have access to something. Okay, if that changes, I would just recommend that you talk to staff because I do think that, you know, based on that first question that we just talked about, you know, if there are additional needs, um, staff are more than able to work with you on that. Uh, the third, how often would upgrades to devices be scheduled? So right now, what are you, how, how do we do that right now? Well, it's based on the need. If equipment isn't fulfilling the need that council members have, obviously, then we would upgrade it. Uh, as with all technology devices, it seems like every few months there's something new coming out. And, and uh, so we're hoping to balance the, the need of the council members to keep current and certainly fulfill your duties as part-time council members with uh, being responsible to taxpayer. Cindy. Sorry, I, I didn't think of these things earlier. I'm thinking of them now as you're speaking about them, but I guess we could say uh, in keeping with best practice as advised by city information management or based on the council member's need. I think that's, that's fine. That's pretty much yeah. what we're doing now, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, I, I think it would be irresponsible if we wanted to upgrade our phones every time there was a new thing out, but I don't know of anyone who has or would do that. So I think, you know, Cindy's link, do you want to restate that? It's a test. It no. is a test. Uh -huh. um, based on uh, best practices based upon uh, the um, advice of the city's information management department uh, and or based on city council members need. I think that sounds great. Yeah, who, I don't know if we do. David uh, Litvak, do we have a new CIO yet? We do not, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, Great. so those are the three uh, policy questions. Uh, any other additional comments about uh, technology or additional needs? Okay. All right, oh, thank you. Cindy Lou. Can I just ask a question? Do yes. you want to see the revised policy given the feedback from now, or do you just want us to move to resolution? Um, go ahead and move to the resolution, but, I, but send the revised policy out. Um, but I don't think you need to wait until, or wait for us to approve it. I think, unless I hear differently, um, you know, we'd like to see it, but don't have that slow you down from the resolution. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, hey, thank you both. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to item number three, 
uh, which is the discussion about the uh, handling of the District 4 um, position. Um, as we have talked about before, and, and while we're not streaming this, um, the video, or there is video being recorded. So hopefully once we get the system worked out, um, that will be online and people will be able to access it. Um, so we've talked uh, about the last time that the city did this, and I believe it was 1998, uh, that the city council um, last uh, made an appointment for uh, a council position. Um, so this is not something that we have done for quite a while. It's not something that we do regularly. Um, as of, well, the last I heard, so uh, the, the application process, or the, the process closed at five o'clock, and the last number I had was 17, 19. is it 19? We're up to 19, and there are potentially two more. The recorder's office is trying to verify them with the county, and uh, as of about 20 minutes ago, they hadn't been able to get hold of the county, so it may be tomorrow before okay. we know on those final two. So between 19 and 21 uh, applicants. So what what we need to do, since we, we don't do this very often, we don't have a specific um, way to follow this. And so um, the staff have worked really hard uh, over the past couple of weeks coming up with some different ideas. And the proposal that I think will outline what the process will look like uh, is what, what I want to finalize tonight. Um, there are the potential of having two more dates um, next week, uh, and then we have time scheduled for the following Tuesday as well, should we need it. Um, but because of the number of applicants, we didn't know how many we were going to have. Uh, when we were first, when the staff were first uh, working on this, but we we thought that even you know with ten applicants, um, having an interview process is going to take uh, quite a bit of time, um, but it is still a very important process to do. But we we were trying to figure out how we can uh, what what form we could provide for candidates to uh, express more of their. Uh, positions and ideas about the council uh, seat and so one of the one of the ideas that we talked about last week a little bit was having a list of written questions uh, that would be released uh, as soon as we're done with this meeting and, and we finalize them what those questions would be um, staff would email everybody uh, who is on the list right now who have uh, applied uh, for candidacy um, it is going to be a very, very short turnaround just because of the time frame that we uh, have to work under. Um, we have to make a decision. This position has to be filled by the end of the month, uh, according to state law. Uh, so we are uh, moving rather quickly. Um, the questions would be emailed tonight. We would, we would ask that those be uh, returned uh, to the city by Friday afternoon um, at 5 p.m. Andrew? Or, or earlier. earlier? Was it earlier? What did we say? We ended up saying noon. We said that, noon? Okay. So Friday I mean, at noon. Just in our draft. We haven't made anything. Fun. Okay. Is there any um, uh, consideration of folks who may not check email or use email? I don't know. I'm not sure if that applies to anybody applying, but we've had that in the past. Um, if that is the case, then I would, I would say that we, you know, there would have to be a phone call. Uh, I just don't know them. if we have any way to sort that out. Well, I, I, the recorder's office should have, you know, a, a, a contact information, either in a phone number or email, uh, and or I should say. We could um, add a, a line to the email that w is sent out, just asking them to confirm with us that they've received it. And if we yeah. don't get that yeah. by yeah. 10 tomorrow morning, then we'll give them a call. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. Do you know what? I, if, if it wouldn't be that difficult, I would actually recommend following up with a phone call Oh, sure. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, just to be safe, yeah. So, uh, Amy, um, I know that we're on a a pretty tight schedule. It does, however, seem like if it gets out today, people don't even get it until tomorrow is Wednesday. Let's say 
even by noon they get it that's a day and a half to answer if we use all of these 20 questions or nearly 20 questions that are rather in depth and we would want some I would hope some pretty thoughtful answers to them yeah that a day and a half considering if people have jobs and families and it, that seems like a almost too close of a timeline I'm wondering what everyone thinks and, and I'm just throwing it out there I of um, at least giving people the weekend to answer these. And I know that would then mean that we have to read them in a day with staff getting them to us on Monday, but. The, I mean, the only, the only trouble with that is we, will, we still have a full agenda, you know, the council agenda, so we're gonna have the packet, so we're gonna have to go through. Um, and I, I worry that if we give ourselves one day to read 21 responses of all of these questions, that we're not going to be able to put the time, you know, to to really put the thought into it um, that we need to do. I, I mean, this is going to be tough on us as well uh, yeah, sure. to properly uh, to properly do it. Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately, that's just kind of a, a the the timeline is a is just a fact that we have to deal with. Um, so I'd be a little bit reluctant um, to do that because I think we need to have the weekend not only to prepare for uh, the regular city business that we're going to have next Tuesday, but also to spend the time that we need. James? Yeah, I was just going to say if there are 20 applicants or for candidacy, we're going to have 400 questions that we're going to have to be answer, uh, reading. So I know we're all going to come with those answers read and, you know, be able to listen and understand who these individuals are and, and where they're going with this. So I understand that it will be difficult for them, but it's going to be even more difficult, I think, for us to make sure that we are well prepared. Sure. Chris? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would be in favor of extending the deadline to submit to Friday night, and then maybe that way people could at least like go leave work early or something and go work on it um, and turn them in by Friday at midnight and then we get them first thing Saturday morning or whatever. Well, that, that, that requires staff oh, to that's work. Right. Yeah, Saturday. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind then. How about Friday at uh, like the, by the close of business and then how long do you think it would take staff to put them all together and send? The issue Cindy. is the posting of packets. It's a procedure that has a lot of steps and yeah. it goes through the state. Oh, so it's okay. not, so we would have people here until at least seven or eight o'clock. Okay. It's probably easier, I may be wrong, but it's probably easier to send out this stuff on Saturday morning than it is to, I, I don't know. Well, well and of course then we'd need to, have somebody physically come in if we wanted it on the internet, huh? That can be done remotely as well. It, um, there was the other question of whether it would be posted publicly that early or whether it would be posted publicly closer to the meeting time on Tuesday. So uh, here's a, a thought. Um, so obviously you figured out how long it's gonna take. I mean, how long would it take to post uh, 21 responses online to make it public um, and uh, I mean does that take a lot of time or how long do you think it would take to get those answers to us? Oh, I always want to be quick um, but realistically to make sure that we have everybody's pages that it's been converted to a PDF to upload it um, and to just making sure that the system is working to post those agenda pages I don't think we could do it in shorter than an hour and a half or two. Okay, but so what, what would your, so an, you, if everything goes right, an hour and a half to two, but you're thinking maybe three hours probably just to be safe. Okay, Amy. Back real quick, yeah. Monday's a holiday. Oh, oh, that's another point. Yeah, that's true. So, there's that. <laughs> hmm, Andrew, did you have a, you didn't have, okay. <laughs> Andrew confirms that Monday is a holiday. Um, if we, uh, what were you going to say, Lehua? I was just going to say, if it's a matter of 
giving the applicants as much time and you wanted to give them until five o'clock on Friday, then I think staff could get that emailed out to the council members and then the posting to the internet could be could happen later. There's the question of do you want all the applicants to have access to everybody else's answer and have their time over the weekend? So there are some equity issues there too. I don't know if that's a matter of concern or if you just want the information public and transparent. Okay, James. I would just suggest a Tuesday post mm -hmm. of the of, of the, the public, of the, the public the, comment the com or making the comments mm -hmm. or the questions public. Okay, I think that makes so sense. So that cuts down on our time because we can literally take the twenty or twenty one emails theoretically that we've received and forward those to council members. That's great. And so, just to clarify, so would you be doing that at noon or at five? Um, I, I would look to the council's direction. What, what if we, so if you think, how long do you think that would take? An hour? At most, yeah. It would um, be. What if, we, what, if we, what if we extended it to four and said, <laughs> gave people until four o'clock, so it's four additional hours, um, and then staff will be able to get that? To Cindy's point, you know, we may have people here anyway. Um, I just don't want to keep people here later than they normally would. Um, would be yeah. for the uh, getting the packets and everything out right so yeah, yeah I agree. we try to get them out by five but not always but and that part would happen on Tuesday morning which the part? Packets oh okay for the public correct is that no, what I'm talking saying? about the, I'm talking about the regular pat so the the council packets for you know the work that the work that's Thursday. being done yeah our schedule for the regular packets I don't think would change on Thursday so that would all happen on Thursday, and this would be additional paperwork that we would provide to you when it's received. Okay. Yeah. So what if we did this then? <laughs> Let's do three o'clock. Okay. Instead of four, that gives staff two hours, and it lets them it, it lets them be out of here on a holiday weekend by five right. o'clock. Okay. Or uh, what? Hmm? <laughs> well, three o'clock or what? I mean, do we have a cutoff period? Oh, if it would be handled by the city recorder's office as the other things mm -hmm. um, are in this process and three o'clock means three o'clock just like five o'clock meant five o'clock okay. mm -hmm. so it would not be a situation where we would have to make judgments okay. because we can't right. yeah. okay. so we would say we did not receive this and then would that person then just be disqualified I don't think as staff we can disqualify them, but we we would not be have answers. It would it, yeah. we wouldn't we would not have answers, and I think that would then um, that would yeah that would affect our decision making ability on that individual. Okay. Does that work? Do we have a sense of how we would um, compile those for us? Uh, one email, separate emails. Um, um, I would envision to get the information to you on Friday afternoon would be taking the email and forwarding it or if it's been provided in hard copy we would scan it in and send them it to you in individual emails okay. um, so each applicant would have their own email with their answers yeah. in order to prepare it for the packet we would take that and convert it to a PDF and each applicant would have their own PDF document in your packet that would okay. be available like that online as well we, I would just ask is there any there's got to be a way to sort of ensure that we don't lose anything on our end um, if they're individual emails they may get mixed into all sorts of other emails um, and not knowing the exact number is there a way to link them somehow or I'm not sure. I'm trying to think through you, what I've you done could before. Put, you could put a, I mean, you could do not a hashtag, but you could just have a standard subject line um, would that would be on there and, and number that. No, so you, like have to applicant it, yeah. one, two, three, four, and then down to 20, and then that way. One of 21, one yeah, of 20, one of 21, 22. then we would be able to see it all. I, I, I'm, I am a little concerned about with 20 some odd of these not getting to one and not realizing I'd missed one um, and then not knowing where it is for some reason. So. I could send kind of like a table of contents email as well that just says for each applicant either the time that the email was sent or that it wasn't received if that applies. And it would be a, uh, you'd have a notice of receipt as well when we opened it? Okay, that's all right. I can set that up if you'd like. <laughs> Not critical. <laughs> okay. 
And I can Chris. text council members to so let them know when they've been sent. Yeah, I mean, I think if we, if, if we, if you do the subject line and just one of, you know, yeah, and that way we will be able to see it. And Chris. Can we, Mr. Chair, pair, or is the plan to pare down this list? Yeah, so what, so what I was thinking is once we figure out, you know, the time and, the, and that, then I want to go through the questions. Okay. Um, so seven of the questions are our questions, so ours being, you know, the, the city's. Um, staff also found uh, additional questions that other cities also ask. Um, so once we, if we're okay with three o'clock on Friday mm -hmm. to have the deadline for uh, for the responses, um, staff will email each individual uh, response to the council um, and have them identified as, as one of 21 or one through 21. Um, then that would be that would be the process then for um, the written questions. So now on the on the second page of the document that's in blue um, are some of the questions and. What I'd like to do, um, just for the record, is read these, read each of these, um, and then we can thumb up, you know, thumbs down, uh, if we want to include them in the uh, written questions. Does that work? And sorry, I was going to suggest that works for me, and maybe something else that would help if we want to think about it as we're going through the questions is having like a word limit because then maybe people don't feel like they have to, you know, when it says, you know, what is your view of local government, people don't feel like they have to write like this treatise about what, you know, so I don't know, yeah. something to consider. I have a good piece of info for you. Oh, yes. Cindy Mansell has just indicated that she could link all of the information and uh, the staff could send it to the council. Right. Or limit. So the word limit, um, what do y'all think about a word limit? I mean, I can see why we would do it. The, down, the, downside, the downside of it is, it, well, it limits, you know, whatever view into someone's thought process. That's the point. I mean, if someone's going to, well, but, if, but, but we'd kind of like to know if someone is going to be incredibly verbose. <laughs> or not so I don't know that I can see both sides but but um, do we want to have a word limit yes. thumbs up thumbs down overall do we want to do it to say hey or you have X amount of words for the entire thing <laughs> yep <laughs> so the, and that would be I, something then that staff would have to verify for each answer yeah no let, that's true what if you said something like we were thinking of approximately 500 words or 100 words or something for each answer so you're so they have some sense of what you're please okay it's not not about exactitude yeah it's not about holding somebody to exact words it's about yeah. helping us so, to actually you know, pay attention okay to so in about yeah. we could say something like that you know in about you know what number now Real quick, sorry, Mr. Chair, I didn't mean to yeah, interrupt no worries. you. Um, I was just thinking about this. What if in sort of the email, we simply say, you know, here is the questionnaire. Please remember that there are 21 applicants. And while we want to hear, why, uh, while we want to hear everything, just make, make. Uh, or encourage people to because, be, just encourage people to be concise. To understand that we have to read them all. we're reading them all. Yeah, but then it sounds like, you know, we're. Yeah, poor us. And that, I, I mean, <laughs> in that case, I, don't, I think we don't say anything. Yeah. And we don't put a word limit on and we just. I mean, I just, I think, I, think, I think we can encourage people to be concise. Mr. Chair, what if we vote, what if we, uh, sorry, I opened this bag or this can of worms, um, but what if we go through the questions first, see how many we come out with, and then decide okay. how we want to limit them? Okay. Okay. So the first question, please share with the council your view on local government and its impact on neighborhoods. Okay, that is a four Andrew votes no on that one. So we will have that as question number one. 
Um, Andrew just chair. doesn't want any questions. Sorry. Uh, yeah, just, Lehua. just to help, if if everyone wanted to circle number two, number eight, 12, 17, and 18 are all quite similar. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so I was thinking, and I'm sorry, actually two, I did this on the, I'm sorry, it's not number two, it's three, and then all the other numbers um, relate in terms of um, how you view who you're representing and what is, and how you approach issues. Okay. So I don't know if you want to do those. So it would be three, three, eight, 12, 17, and 18. Right. Um, so I will just read the question number three first, and then if we like that, we'll just go with that and cut the others out. Does that work? Uh, if you were selected to fill the seat, would you represent the district, the city as a whole, or a combination of the two? <laughs> okay, so we'll strike all of those questions. Three, well, eight. Well, this eight is pretty good. Like. You like twelve. Oh. Why don't we read just a circle? Okay, the circled ones. Okay, we can do that. Uh, number eight, regarding controversial issues, how would you view your obligation? Is it to support the majority opinion of the voters that elected you, or is it to support what you feel is best, or is in the best long-term interest of the city, even when your choice would go against the majority? Okay, so that one's out. Number 12, uh, to you, what does it mean to be a representative? Okay, so that's four, five, yeah. So that'll be in, okay. Uh, 17, do you believe your role as a council member is to study policy issues, also listening to and educating community members and then make the best, possible cho or the best choice possible for the community, or do you believe your role will be to make policy decision based on polls or surveys or what you speculate the majority of the community would prefer regardless of what you believe to be the best decision, why? <laughs> yeah. 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 A lot, yeah. <laughs> of all time. Um, okay, so no on that one. Number 18, what do you believe your role as a representative of the citizens of our city? 12, yeah, so we'll, I'm no on that. Do you like that? You like 18 better? Okay, so three to two. 18 instead of 12. 18 instead of 12? That's great. Okay. 18, not 12. Bye bye 12. Okay. Uh, number two, what are some of your hopes for Salt Lake City in the coming years? Okay. <laughs> Uh, three to two, so that one we will do. Um, All right, so we'll yeah. keep it? Yeah. Keep it, yes. Um, number four, what do you think are the top issues facing District 4, and how would you approach each of them? <gasps> the unanimous vote, okay. Uh, so yes on four. Uh, Number five, what do you think are the key issues facing Salt Lake City and how do you approach each of them? This is the same as not really. it, this district and then it's the city, <laughs> right? Yeah. This is the same as okay. what, what do you want for, for Salt Lake? It is similar. Turn this on. So, again, renewing my down okay. to Okay, Andrew. I don't like the previous one, but I like this one better, uh, especially if we can limit it to a certain number, three, Five. Okay. So number four did pass, or uh, yeah, number four did pass. Do we want to keep no, number five? No, I like number four. I don't like number two. Oh, you don't like number two? Number two is yeah, not good. I like your hopes for the city. That makes sense. Okay. I like the eight. Like, what do you see? Okay. So let's vote again on number two, uh, up or down. Okay. So number two's gone. We're going to have no written questions. Um, okay, so four, you want to keep four, and five, do you want to keep five? 
Yes, okay. All right, number six. What issues have had the biggest impacts on District 4 over the past several years, similar to number four? I'm a no. James is a yes. Okay, um, so that one's a no. Um, number seven. We recognize that no legislative body is perfect in their budget. I vote no after that. Um, no, we recognize that no legislative body is perfect in their budget and the policy decision making. Uh, what, do, what changes would you like to see for the focus, uh, functioning, or decision making of Salt Lake City Council? Okay. Um, yes. That's a yes. All right, so just to be clear, because this, pro this is anything but, um, the yes is right now, so one, four, five, and seven, or what I have right now, is that right? Okay. And you have uh, number two as well? No, we no, took we, that we, out. No, we, we took two out. Number. We liked it and then we hated it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it had a very short life. Uh, <laughs> number nine, tell us the ideas you have that will make our city a better place to live. <laughs> It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Number 10. If you were selected and sub subsequently reelected, what major accomplishments would you consider to be a personal victory for the city and yourself? <laughs> <laughs> no. Just, just close okay. your eyes, Chris. Chris. <laughs> 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 Infrastructure, um, this has A, B, and C. Uh, infrastructure. They're a grouping of similar questions again. You what? It's a grouping of similar okay. questions. Okay, uh, so A, what do you feel is our city's greatest need for infrastructure and how would you propose we address and fund it? Let's read them all first. Oh, come on, okay. B, B, prioritize uh, what you see as the top three infrastructure needs for our city over the next five years and explain your choices. And C, uh, we can all agree that infrastructure is a major expense for our city's budget. What would be your approach to best finance this essential service? B. B. B? B. Okay. Uh, is that no on A and C? Yeah. Okay. So B, yes. A and C, no. 13. Looking at the needs of our city, would you adjust the spending and money brought in from taxes, and how would you propose doing that? All right, this is 13, 14, 15, and 16 are also a grouping okay. of budget-related. Okay, you want to read so them together. before we vote on these, I'll read them all. Uh, 14, do you believe it is more important for the city to find ways to cut its budget or to become more efficient over time and provide the same quality of service at the lowest cost, 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 or cost possible? What is the distinction between the two views of keeping costs low and delivering essential city services? 15, with limited resources and unlimited wants, uh, what do you believe should be the city's priorities when it comes to spending? 16, what is your philosophy on the city's budget and finances? Do you tend to be fiscally conservative or progressive and explain your monetary approach? I like 14. You are such an attorney. <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't read it. I honestly didn't read it that way. But now that you said it, I, I agree. Yes. So, yeah. so well done. That's the verdict. Um, okay, so 15. Does everyone like 15? With the syntax correction. Yes. It's, yeah. Um, okay, so. I'm taking that as a no on 13, yep. no on 14, and a no on 16. Is that correct? 15. Yeah. Is 15 too close to other things you've asked, just adding monetary to it? S similar, but I don't, I think it's five. different. I think it's different enough. Four, five. Go to make any spending decisions. 
decision, how we can make that decision. Okay, number 19. Uh, what is your understanding of receiving council training and your commitment to learn your duties as a council member? Well, I, I, think, I wonder if there's a way we can come up with a question that talks about time. I mean, because there it is dedication, right? And then how much time is, I, I think that's what we're trying to get at here is, is how much time it really requires, right? I think we should just quote James and ask if they believe that. Yeah. Your personal relationships will improve while you're on the case. They do. Yes or no? Oh, mine do. <laughs> okay. Maybe because I'm not around. So I, okay. <laughs> Does anyone want 19? I, I, I don't like the way it's worded. I don't either. To James's point, um, do you want to propose language? Oh, I mean, that's wordsmith that we have two attorneys here for. Who? Well, <laughs> I like 20. <laughs> <laughs> I think the lie. That's Come a good. On, that's no. a. We're gonna have liars on this. I mean, every applicant is going to want to believe that they're going to put in the dedication, and they wouldn't have applied. I think that's fair. Okay. So again, I, I get, So here are the questions that I have. So we've we've now gone from 19 uh, to. Question number one, question number four, five, seven, eleven B, fifteen. <laughs> and eighteen. Eighteen, yes. So that's seven. Oh, questions. and eighteen, yes. You ask them to create their own question on twenty and answer it. Okay, so seven questions I think is much more manageable, um, especially because of the time that we were concerned about. Um, in the short time frame, I think that's very doable. Do any of you have any hey, that was, any, co any questions, concerns? Or are we good with those seven? Mr. Chair, that was a great way to cut all those questions down. Okay. Well, thank you all for all of your work. <laughs> I, I am um, serious about 20, though. I'd like to. No, I, we're not doing we 20, Andrew. Uh, Let's hear <laughs> I would like to. I would be very interested if they were asked to form a question and then answer their own question. Mm -hmm. I like that, actually. It would tell us a lot about the makeup. What, a, tell me a lot about the makeup. what the, about like something that, to your point a little bit. Thank you, Amy. It, something of like, tell us, like give them space to say something about themselves that maybe they would want us to know that's different from the question. Like, and different from, them. different from like what they submitted as an as a resume. This is kind of an open-ended. Give us a paragraph that you want to tell us. Just why? Why do you want this? Yeah, or something interesting about yourself that you like. I don't know, breed unicorns or something. Unicorns. Are cool. <laughs> I, I like that. I like. If they go, Okay. Or a question that maybe they want to respond to that isn't on there. Right. Yeah. So maybe just maybe just what else um, for for that question? What else would you like to share uh, with the council council members? That you haven't already shared. Yeah, that you haven't already shared. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have eight questions now. Nice. Um, and they will be due on Friday at 3. They'll go out tonight, right? And staff will follow up uh, tomorrow with a phone call to each individual uh, or voicemail. Um, great. Okay, so next week um, on the 22nd, this is where um, things will get uh, very interesting because we will... I, I want to make sure that everyone has time. Um, we've talked about five minutes, uh, that each applicant would have five minutes to give a verbal presentation. Um, we will, uh, as far as 
is the five minutes. Are you, are you all comfortable with that amount of time? That's not a lot of time. I mean, I would like to hear, and, and, and the other thing that it doesn't really do is create an opportunity for a back and forth. Um, because then one, what we do on the back and forth with one person would probably be different than someone else which then could be construed as being unfair or um, being weighted towards somebody else. And so I think the, you know, having a standard five minute um, time frame for each person without a Q&A, um, while less interesting, makes yeah, more sense. No back and forth, too subjective. Plus we all customers, so. Right. Yeah, look how long it took me to explain that. Well, <laughs> Mr. Chair, I think, I think it goes back to the questions too, where it, it really isolates those questions in getting those answers for yeah. us. So, and then they can come present and we can see how they do. Yeah. yeah. Does that work? Yep. Okay, five minutes, no back and forth. Um, the meeting will be held in the chamber, um, even though it's gonna be, what time are we talking about starting? Um, right now it looks like about 3.30 or four after a few items on your council agenda. Okay. Um, and the ch I like doing it in the chamber, um, especially because we're not going to really. Ha I mean, we're not. We don't need the uh, AV equipment for that portion. So I, I was going to say maybe we should do it in here, but I now have argued against my oh, own point. So okay, Cindy. One thing you could do is, because of the five minute time being so short, if you did want to have it in here, you could put a podium, a table podium up and just have them come up to that podium. Um, just depends on what you. I, I like, I, I'm back to the formal now. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so what, for the five minutes, um, the points are that you know, each, the applicant may address the council on any of the information submitted as part of the written information. Not a time for Q&A or dialogue with the council. The purpose is to provide equal time for each applicant and time for each applicant will be timed by the council staff, so similar to what we do with um, the public comment. Public comment. Public comment. Okay. Yeah, first let's go to Chris and then Cindy. Do yeah. we have No, I mean, I, I, I don't really want to provide written questions for this. I want to hear what they're going to articulate. Oh, yeah. If you have a second round, do you mean? That's when we get to the second round. Wait, yeah. I they are. Right. Okay. So we will have we will have reviewed that information. We will have you know we will have already read that, and then the five minutes is open for the application or the, the application the applicant to, to say whatever they want to say. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Okay, that works. Okay, Cindy. So we wouldn't give them guidance to focus their presentation on the written information. I I. I don't think so. I want to, yeah, I, I want to hear what they have to. Okay. Yep. We'll update them. Cindy? You covered it. Cover, okay. Okay. Now, once we get to the selection part, um, that's that, I guess that's where I wasn't sure if we could do it across the hall. Would we then come back to do it here, or do you think that we could get a screen and some sort of. The reason that the reason that we'll want the screen is, you know, as with all of our votes, even the you know leadership votes uh, that we make, they're all public. Um, so all of our votes are going to be publicly registered, um, and the thought is that you know we would want to have it on some sort of a, a board or an overhead, um, and if we can do that in the formal meet or in the formal room, that'd be great. Um, We've got the TV in the. Screen. Yeah, our okay. thought was yeah, it won't be as visible, but we can certainly do it. Okay, I mean, for because I assume we're going to have a crowd, so you know, seating wise, it's it's going to be better over there anyway. So, if we can, if we can, 
Okay, I, I do like having something, even if it's small, um, just to have it up there. We have one screen that we could use there. Right, that's right. One. So what we would what we would anticipate doing is passing out to the council members ballots similar to what you used for leadership, yeah. and with all the applicants' names on it, you would all take your vote, and then either the city recorder, probably the city recorder would read off council member Johnston, and then mm -hmm. and as they are reading off who you voted for, we would add that to the screen so that it's presented to the audience and then okay. we would go down so they would just read through the ballots like they do for the leadership and okay we would add that to tally to the spreadsheet which would be broadcast on the screen in the meeting so if we had our own computers up there we could see real time on our computers if the screen's facing the audience that's a good point we can figure that out absolutely yeah okay. good question thank you um so for the selection process uh what we what we're, what is proposed here is that the council may select applicants to move on to a second round of interviews. Uh, the council will use a ballot similar to the process used for selecting the chair and vice chair. Each council member will select four applicants out of the 21 to continue on for a second round of interviews. Only those applicants with four or more votes will move on to a second round interview. And depending on how many applicants receive four or more votes, the council will decide whether to do a second ballot to reduce the number of applicants. The council may decide to invite only four applicants for a second round interview. And could I add, based on our conversation last yeah. week, I think also that if you did not have enough applicants who received four votes, that you would decide whether that meant to then narrow the pool to those who received a vote and revote, right? You would yeah. Yeah, or or, or instead or of or instead of four applicants, we have three applicants. So so essentially, you know, what we're saying is that the threshold would be that you have to have four votes in order to in order to move Second forward. So if we don't get that, then instead of having four candidates, we would have fewer. Yep. Yep. Okay. Is that clear? You have to have at least four to move forward. Correct. Four, four, four individuals maximum, but each of those four have to have four. Yeah. Yep. Have we got our math right on that, that there's no way that that can be more than four? That's right, we, right? Okay. It, sorry. Cindy. Uh, yeah. it, it's possible, but uh, because you're not required to vote for four, but you can vote for four. What we were thinking is that if you ended up with eight, uh -huh. that had four votes, then you, you um, could do a second round. Oh, okay. So it's just a narrowing process. Gotcha. Thank you. Can I ask? Sure. Oh, sorry, I had a second yeah. question. Yeah, no. I've had two applicants ask me um, if they think uh, or if they should have supporters or endorsers contact us. And I said that that I that we had, that had as far as I knew a decision hadn't been made about that. I said that I personally would not like a bunch of emails or phone calls from people, and that if someone wanted to like list people that were supporting them in in some document, that that would be preferable to me. But that I didn't know if we were even going to accept that. Do you and you know and and I've because I've had the the same question, and what I've told people is that we. You know, as of now, we don't have, um, you know, you can do what you want to do. Um, part of it, I think, it will certainly weigh on us if that works, you know. If it doesn't work, if it, you know, if it rubs us the wrong way, then that might be something that we would look at and say, hey, you know, that's going to, that's going to, you know, kind of shape my decision of this individual. So. You know, in some ways, I think having, giving the flexibility for them to campaign how they're going to campaign, um, you know, it's just like us. We don't know exactly how, you know, when we were running, you know, what, you know, what our comments were going to do. And if, if people were going to like them, that's just part of what we're doing. So I'd say, I'd say they're, you know, it's up to them. Okay. Well, but does that go through the recorder's office, though, with their... Um, their questions, for instance, or does it come right to the council office separately? 
what? Like endorsements, letters of recommendation, those kind of things. No, I mean, I, I think that, well, I think, I think a lot of us have already have met with candidates. I mean, I've, I've been trying to meet with anybody who's, who's reached out. Um, so I think, you know, if they want it, I don't think there's a, I don't think we make a formal way to, you know, share endorsements or, you know, other materials. I think if they want to, if they want to email it to us or, you know, snail mail it or whatever. I'm just I asking, for the, I'm just asking for the recorder's office what the expectation is on their end. If they take I, I, don't th I don't think they would. I mean, I think as far as the recorder, the only response, responsibility that the recorder would have would be... Um, taking in the written questions. Um, they had the responsibility of doing the, or doing the applications. But after that, I don't think there's, other than certifying the, mm -hmm. um, the decision, I don't think there's any, I think they're out of the, out of the loop on it. Am I right on that? Okay. I'm just trying to make sure if they get sent to the recorder's office, what's the recorder's office it would feel like they need to us. do with other materials. Yeah, I, so I, I would just say if anything co question. goes to the recorder's office, just share it with the council office um, as, as soon as possible. But okay. yeah, I, I think the fewer guidelines we give people, um, the more we're going to know who we're dealing with. So that'd be my thought. You up? Yeah, <laughs> which we're kind of doing, sort of. Um, okay, so that, so that works. Does anyone have any issues with uh, the four and four? Nope. Uh, okay. Um, so then we are left with the decision about how we want to proceed from there. Um, I think that depending on how the day is going, um, if we can make a decision next week, I would like to make a decision next week. I don't know if that's going to be possible. Um, if and I and I do know that that's going to put a lot of I mean that that puts a lot on us, not only to uh, internalize the written uh, the written pieces of of information, but you know quickly hearing the the um, twenty one folks narrowing it to four um, I think we move forward um, do any of you have an issue with that or because the other option would be um, that once you have those uh, up to four individuals then they would have a week uh, to do whatever else they're going to do and then we would meet the following week to decide do you see an advantage of an additional week of process after We've narrowed it down. Mr. Chair, yeah, I would just say that I think it sort of should maybe remain open. I think if there is a, at least a close consensus or people have, uh, we kind of have an idea, then we make a decision on the 22nd. But if there are like very, you know, there's four people that kind of everybody's all over the board, then I think we should make sure that we're processing that and having a second round of interviews and, and going to the next day. But I think it will kind of depend on what that, what that looks like in my mind. I mean, yeah. if there's a lot of controversy over the, not controversy, but differences between all of us over the four people, then it seems like we would probably have to, or at least want to process and maybe ask some follow, have that, that second round of interviews. Um, but I, I hope, would hope that we're, all in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so a question for staff and possibly Margaret. Um, if we if we keep this if we keep it open, um, is there a problem with uh, would would the candidates potentially you know have a problem if if we said okay, you know we're we may go into, we may add, a, and add an additional week. We may decide that one day. Is it too ambiguous uh, to get us into trouble, or do we need to be more specific on which night we are going to make a decision? So the statute requires that you give a minimum of 14 days' notice before the council meeting at which 
um, a decision is likely to be made. I mean, that's not verbatim, but it's something like that. The reason that we had you notice up multiple dates was so that you didn't have to repeat that 14-day minimum, and you could put everyone on notice of the dates that they're expected to be available to come in for an interview because council may actually vote on one of those dates. Okay. And so I think from a statutory perspective, you've covered the base of extending it beyond the 22nd to one of the other already noticed dates. It, but we would be okay acting on the 22nd. Yeah, you are okay acting on the 22nd. Okay. Uh, I just want to, oh, sorry. Yes. No, please. I defer. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, the, uh, uh, I kind of want to echo what I think Amy was saying, that unless there's a very clear consensus, which I would define as like very obvious, um, uh, I'm inclined to say that we need the two dates. Because I, I feel like I'm going to want time to think about what people have said and possibly reread what they write after they've spoken. Um, so that's just, I just want to give um, my colleagues, um, that's where I'm at. Okay. Um, and so I don't anticipate that I will be prepared to vote on the 22nd unless absent extreme circumstances. Okay. Andrew? Uh, two points. I think one is depending on how our fatigue is at that point, we don't do our best decision making late. Um, no offense to any of us here. Uh, Setting a jerk. No. <laughs> second piece is um, we'll be across the hallway. We'll have 20 some odd presentations, so to speak, uh, with no Q&A. We won't necessarily be talking with each other up there about the consensus. So I don't see how we come to a consensus within that time frame unless we come back here and have an open discussion about it. Um, so I'm more open to um, looking at the following week, unless there's a clear something changes. But okay. James. No, nope. Andrew answered it for me. Is just I think that after we've read all of these responses and we start listening, it's gonna it's gonna wear us down a bit. So, um, but if there is that opportunity, that if it is a, a true consensus, I don't have a problem voting that night. I really don't. My preference still is two nights. So, um, you know, I but leaving the option open for that consensus candidate um, makes sense, so. Okay, so we will, we will let all of the applicants know that, is, that a decision could be reached next week, um, but will, will, will likely be the following week. Okay. And so from safe? And then Andrew? we would plan on that being the 29th. That would be the 29th. Would we plan on uh, scheduling time to come back here after that presentation to discuss here or no? After the presentations were done for that day, theoretically. Can I, can I just suggest? Yeah, I, I think those discussions have to be public. I, yeah, I don't think, do. I mean, we can't, we can't go into a closed meeting or anything no, that's else. My, so. That's what I meant, come back over here in this setting and discuss. What we typically would do is preserve all of your options. Mm -hmm. So if the, you felt some need to do that, or if it made sense to you to do that, okay. then we would preserve that as an option, okay. typically. Okay. Timing wise on the agenda, you may be running up against a dinner break so that you can start your formal meeting on time at seven, but we can easily list that type of discussion on the agenda so that you can come back at whatever point that ends up working okay. out schedule wise. Thank you. Mr. Chair, may I yes, make Amy. another suggestion? Uh -huh. um, I was kind of, and it's skipping ahead a little bit, I was looking at um, the second round of interviews and also some of the questions presented on the back in green. Uh -huh. And I just came up with this idea because there was, number two says during the second round would the council prefer to set any guidelines so that the same general topics are covered? Um, what, what does everyone think about perhaps like either we as individuals come up with one question that we ask everyone so there would be six questions at that second round of interview or having staff come up with um, X amount of questions so that those those are all the same questions that we ask everyone and maybe either 
if we decide to do it, like all six of us have one question to ask, like one separate question that we kind of come up with on our own or staff that we have that prepared by next week so that we could make sure to go through those if there is a second round of interviews. Does that make sense what I said? I feel like I'm rambling these days, but. Do I think any of you, did all of you process that? Chris? Uh, <laughs> I agree. Okay. Great. Do you think that there will be time in 10 minutes for each of you to ask a question and have, or should, because we could do, other cities have done it in a random format where you each would have a prepared question and then for each of the applicants we would, you know, pull number seven and that you, it would indicate you're the one who's going to ask that applicant a question and number three and, you know, so it just, it shakes it up, it retains it being spontaneous, but it limits it to the time. Just a thought. I like that idea too. Yeah. So. Could we allow them to pick which one of us asks the question? Is that too much uh, outside the box? All right. Right. Let's see where I'm going on this. Okay. Do any of you have any issues with the uh, second round uh, discussion, which could take place that night, but will probably take place the following week? Okay. On the process questions on the back. Um, so we've talked about Amy's. Um, I think that may cover it. Um, the only one is number three. Okay. Um, in terms of selecting the order of interviews, we could put each applicant's name in a hat and you could pick and that's how the person comes up or we could order them alphabetically. I like Why the number bucket that we that we use today. That's Why don't always, we just do like great. the order they filed though? What? The order that they filed. Random. Random. Okay. Yeah. And that would be true for both the first round and the second round. Okay. James will bring his gaucho hat. Oh, I will for sure. <laughs> I'll dress up for that. And then I guess the same question for number four, right? How are we going to do read the ballots or? Mm -hmm. And I think it would be the same in both where we'll set up the screen in the chamber. And um, as they're read, staff will enter it into a spreadsheet. But I mean, it's this question says when the council ballots are filled out. Oh, no. Okay, so um, my question for Lehua and Brian do you have, so we've gone through all the questions, we've narrowed it down to eight, talked about the process, we've talked about uh, Amy's um, recommendation. Are you all clear with, you know, with where we are and, and what needs to be done? Does staff have any questions or anything we missed that we ought to discuss? Um, as, as far I, as my notes, I think. We're good. Okay. So I just want to thank um, all my council colleagues. This was, a, you know, not the standard way that we will uh, conduct a work session, but I, you know, I don't know how else we could have done it. Um, this, this is something that, you know, we can replicate now um, in the future if, if needs be. Um, so we're, we're in a better spot, you know, a future is a better spot for us than, than we had. So, yeah. Andrew, did you have a comment? No. Okay. Uh, in that case, we will get those questions out tonight. Um, and I don't have any other items on our work session. Uh, Cindy, do we have, do we have a report from uh, the executive director? Oddly, yes, I thought no, but yes. <laughs> Cindy Lou just informed me that um, we there is one person who applied uh, before the deadline who has not been yet verified with the county, won't be until morning. So we need to know whether to go ahead and send out everything to everyone except that person or send it all, including that person, 
or wait until tomorrow for everyone. I would recommend send it tonight to everybody, including that person. Okay. Thank Does you. anyone have a problem with that? Okay. All right. Any other um, information from the director? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.